Hey everyone and welcome to another video. My name is Elric and in this video we are going to be creating the data that is going to assist us in creating the tables for the archive, history, and snapshot versions of each of our tables in our base or in our, in our subject for the archive, history, and snapshot databases. Um, the main thing to take away from here is we're not going to create them we're not going to duplicate the columns in main as we do in uh, archive history and snapshot. We're actually going to take the data in main and turn it into JSON and store one JSON record just in case the schema ever changes way down the line. We don't have to worry about updating something else. It'll the JSON will just get bigger or smaller. And yeah, so hope you enjoy and I will see you soon. All right, so everyone remember this from zero, zero, zero. Well, this is kind of where we are at right now. A um, lot to do, but the more we progress, the faster creating all of these things are going to be. That's why we're spending so much time in the system. But what I want to look at is the, the four databases, the main history, archive, and snapshot databases. So right now we have our main tables or tables on our main databases have these variety of keys, taxonomy IDs, descriptor columns. Uh, I didn't show implied columns, but those also sequencing and our system flags. So when we're creating archive history and snapshot versions of these tables or the data, which is the mo more important piece is the data um, to create tables identical to the the main tables isn't really productive um, if we have schema changes then we'll have to change the history tables you know we'll we'll have to change all these tables and the schema edits is what we're trying to avoid so the best way that we can approach this is to take the current tables data or the the state that it was in and save it to its appropriate area, the history archive or snapshot um, database. So that's what our history archive and snapshot tables are going to look like, <coughs> is that they will still have the primary key and tenant ID and the system flags, uh, active archive, trusted, security planning, display, and other, except they will have three columns dedicated to the table that they represent. So each history table would have a primary key implied, a specific data set number implied, and row JSON. These implied keys we used in the relationship, um, they're just here so we can easily take these two um, fields and figure out where the record came from. Like, do you want to parse a table's name to find the data set ID? Or if we have the specific data set number implied in here, well, we can just grab that and look up what table it came from. And then for the history archive and snapshot, they only have, they do have their unique columns, like the history has a date ID, date, date time, and then a DML action. And you'll see the archive, date ID, date, date time. No DML action because we understand that it's been deleted. And the snapshot has a date ID, date, date time, both begin and end. So when we look at these, um, the date is a very important piece because we're representing the date in a dimensional format, the date ID, uh, actual day format, the date, and the date time, the date including the time. So we have this very um, easy to group or access and easy to expand upon date system for each of these tables. Now in history, the DML action is just like the SQL command dollar sign action where it'll say update, delete, or insert. And for snapshot, the, the data is really gonna be coming from history and or archive. And mostly history because archive when you delete something, you'll also have a history record if it's enabled. And that'll allow us to go straight from history in the snapshot. So we can, if we forget to snapshot, we can always recreate that. Now looking at the tables inside of history, archive and snapshot, 
if we look at the data set subject, the data set will no longer have a data set type ID. The, the realm or the class will no longer have a realm ID. There's no sort of um, clustering involved outside. Uh, I just noticed I did forget a column in all of these tables is the specific data set number for the history archive and snapshot table itself. That will be our cluster key or our taxonomy key, whatever we want. Um, oh, that'll take place of that because there's no real relationship. It's just a destination. Here's what happened. There's no use for a taxonomy. There is no use for a cluster at this level. But all of our data sets will basically, well, all of our subjects will just have the appended history, archive, or snapshot as their name. So what do we add to get this functionality? Now we do have to add a little bit of code. Um, it's a actually a very fast process, but we have to add a ton of data. So the first pieces of data that I'll go over is we had a family of abstract for our previous table creation videos. We have to create three more types, the archive history and snapshot type. And I'm basically using the base um, type under abstract, ta abstract table as my um, base for the data set name, subject family abbreviation and subject name. And then we'll have to add new families. Right now, our base realm class family types, they're all under the unassigned family. So I said way back in the day, I don't really have a use for that yet. And this is why is because we want to keep the data set name data set and go backwards and say, oh, data set type. And then we'll go back one step and we'll have to update that assigned to something like main. So now we have these main uh, type data set and then we have archive type data set and history type data set, history realm data set. Now we'll be able to get groups of data data sets or data in general using a single key name and then slowly filter it down via the classification taxonomy. Uh, now a lot of other data we have to add is data points for each of these tables. Fortunately, the tables aren't very big. And finally, we do have to add two more um, pieces to our relationship definition to data point type to say, hey, in my unique index, make sure you add DML action date time and DML or uh, UDT DML action date time and UDT snapshot date time. So it builds the unique index appropriately. So let's take a look at the code or the data itself. Uh, for the data set family, I went ahead and grabbed that unassigned that we've been using and I copied it in sheets. I updated the name and key name to archive history and snapshot. And then I put it back in the data set family. And these are the IDs I got back six, seven, and eight. For data set type, under that unassigned family, I grabbed the data that was there, the base realm class family type. And I duplicated it several times to create my, let's see if I have to go back. Six would be the archive family, seven history family. So six archive family have the same set of data, base realm class family type. History family, base realm class family type, and snapshot family, base realm class family type. And the three other items that I had to add were for the abstract um, container. This is what an archive table template is. This is what a history template is. This is what a snapshot template is. So these types are meant for classifying the table after it was created. And these types are meant f as a templated base to create the table. So when I look at the data set template, these being my data set types, like I said, I just kind of copied the um, base abstract table template. And then I appended archive history and snapshot to that name made sure I updated the type and put it back in. And these were the data set type or data set IDs that I got back. 
So for the data points, I did start out with the data point type uh, dump just to make sure that I got everything. But when we're working with actual data points, it's a lot easier to see what we need and how we're going to fill it out. Um, when entering this data, I highly recommend that you add a space in between or an empty line in between each of your tables because a very important piece of these table construction pieces are or is the sequence. Now the sequence number um, will determine how that table looks when it's created because we have an ordering in our concatenation. So it's extremely important that we have it in the right order. And by putting a space in between the tables, you can actually use the filter function and Google Sheets is smart enough just to grab the smaller section so you can order by that sequence to make sure everything is in the appropriate order. So my history, they said um, our standard tenant specific data set number and primary key, our standard system flags. We have our two implied pieces. Uh, in other words, a one-sided relationship we have our date representation, our action representation, and our row JSON. For our archive, same thing, primary key, tenant, and specific data set number, our system flags, our one-sided representation, our date piece, and our row JSON, no action, archived, means removed from the system. So we understand that this has been deleted. And finally, the snapshot, again, primary key tenant and specific data set number, system flags, one-sided relationship, and then a begin date, I'm gonna just call it a dimension, a date dimension the row JSON, and then the end. And I did this specifically. Sometimes it gets a little confusing when you have six days in a row or six date pieces in a row. So sometimes I like to split them with a, a column. There's no rhyme or reason to why I put row JSON right here, except for that. I feel that it's easier to look at when you're doing um, select top whatever from. And finally, the last piece that we had to add was I went into my system relationship table and I found the definition 10, which meant it was a unique index definition. I just pulled any row. This was the row that I found, pasted it and made sure that I changed whatever data point type ID this was to the DML date time and the snapshot date time to make sure that our unique indexes are properly formed on our archive history and snapshot tables, or else we would only be able to add one record and then it would fail from then on. So we added date time to the index, which we should never get the same um, because the implieds are also in there. The implied keys are also in our unique index. We should never get the same record being updated at the same time on the same millisecond. It just shouldn't happen. And if it does, we have a really high performance system and we might have to uh, make a custom unique index for it, but I think this will do for now. So that's really it in terms of data editing. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. I will show you just kind of how they look like when they're created, because that will be the next video, um, actually creating them with the code. And this is kind of what you um, can expect. All the null defaults are set up too. So again, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Remember, like this video and YouTube will recommend it to other users in our industry and subscribe to support me. I will see you next time.